Hey folks, it's your boy BQ. Welcome back to the channel. This is Power Moves, third episode of the NWA podcast that I have resurrected from the dead and brought back here to the channel. So my desk is a little messy today. I apologize. I've got so much shit going on right now with uh, my son's birthday and uh, just some other things I'm working on. So I've just got crap on my desk. So you can see this little pile of junk right here. I usually try not to uh, let that come off on screen, but frankly, there's no other room to put it on this desk. This is like a Dave Meltzer desk right now. That is how my area is looking. So, um, and I've got this empty USC coffee cup here. It's not even the coffee cup I'm I'm currently drinking from right now. It's my Indiana Pacers cup I got from Gaines Ridge Fieldhouse when I went to go see the Clippers play there. So, yeah, Mr. Unprofessional, but it's all good. Negative BQ in the place to be. So this is a third episode of the Power Moves podcast. Uh, for the most part, I'm kind of doing this podcast for fun right now on the channel. You know, the majority of my subscribers are just kind of impact TNA guys and fans and girls. And, you know, but there's some some people out there checking NWA. And I'm hoping that my, uh, my followers continue, uh, not continue, but I hope that a lot of my followers decide they want to give NWA a chance for something different you know for me it's an hour-long show which is really easy for me to watch i was explaining on um one of my impact podcasts i don't know what it was this past week that after going to rebellion i had to take some time off and, and the wife and i went to st louis for a few days um i because i get wrestling doubt you know watching two, two days four hours of wrestling i can't watch that much wrestling at once it's very uh I know a lot of wrestling fans can. For me, I just can't. I always have to break it up. But with NWA, I can kind of watch it straight through, and it's not um, its its not killing me. You feel me on that? So uh, we're going to get into this episode. This was Hard Times 3. I believe it's the last Hard Times episode. I have to imagine it is because that's nine total matches. I can't, th I can't believe they did like 12. NWA doesn't really shove wrestling down your throat like that. So I could be wrong. Um, but as I've been saying, the hard time shows, uh, it was reported 1,200 people in the place to be, and it looks great on, on TV. It looks great. I had accidentally pulled up the episode, the last episode from the previous season when I was getting ready to watch this. I just, I just pulled the wrong episode up. And it was from the, I don't know, what do they call it? The power station or whatever. I don't remember what city it's done in, but... That that was one of their more indie looking locations. The, st the stage setup was great. Don't get me wrong, but like you could tell that there's 150 people in the crowd. You know, like it, it was definitely a small setup. Uh, but they've had some of these venues. You know, when they did Florida for I think of Sarasota, like great turnout. Uh, this Dothan, Alabama, is a great turnout. So they're finding their um, they're finding their locations where where people were really going to fill up the arena. But it was just weird. <laughs> I'm only bringing that up because it was so weird how good this has been looking and sounding on TV and then accidentally pulled up this older episode. I'm like, eek. You know, so. Uh, but if you're if you're one of my followers and you're checking this out, you're like, hell, I'm just listening to BQ talk. You know, give, give these uh, give these last three episodes a chance. I think that that might, might bring you in a little bit. You know, there's some... There's some real ups and downs within NWA television, and there there was a period of time, man, it was rough. That uh, it, this was like right after the I won't say right after the pandemic, but no, it was it was several several uh, seasons after that. But they had the setup where you couldn't see the fans at all, and you can tell there wasn't a lot there either. Like it. I was worried about the company at the time. I'm not going to lie to you. I was like, this is this is not looking good. And then you like fast forward to now, and there's been a lot of growth. You know, so it's it's a very positive thing, and um, we're gonna get it. We're gonna we're we're gonna get it in. We're gonna talk about this. This was hard times three, as I said. They're doing a U.S. tag team title tournament because the Immortals gave up their titles to wrestle for wrestle um, uh, Blunt Force Trauma which they lost that match. So now there's a tournament, a Tony Khan style tournament. The only issues I have with these tournaments is, is maybe I'm just blind. I never see the brackets. 
I never know like who's involved in them. They just kind of all of a sudden like, hey, this is a tournament match. Maybe I'm missing it on social media. I have no idea. Like I know when they do the Crockett Cup, you know who the, who the teams are. You know the brackets. But when they do some of these other ones, they've done like TV title tournaments and all that. Like it's just like they just throw the match at you. I have no clue who else is involved in this. If I'm missing it, that's my fault. But I, I have no idea. So this opening one was um, Alex Misery. Well, well, let me say this first of all. Going into this episode, I was like, this is a one episode match. I mean, a, a one match episode. That's how I viewed it before I actually watched it. This opening match still supported that theory. <laughs> still supported that uh, that that uh, the the mindset that I was into. That's a better way of putting it. The mindset I was into going into the episode. This one kind of supported it. Uh, I had no emotional connection to this. This was Alex Misery and Mecha Wolf versus Daisy Kill and Talos. They didn't play into Vampiro from the previous episode. Having memory issues, I, I don't know. I, that's the best way I can, I can paint it. It's like he just came out with this team, because they just said the previous week, you know, you're you're going to go out there with Alex Misery and Mecha Wolf, and he didn't know what I think it was Kyle Davis interviewing him. He didn't know what he was talking about, so that wasn't played into at all. So I don't really understand that. But anyway, it starts off with a with a a very bad ukulele song by daisy kill this was i talked about the previous week they had kratos rapping and how cringe that was like this was on that level i don't know why they keep starting off episodes with like this major major cringe these major major cringe angles (laughs) you know but um i don't as i said i had no real emotional investment to this match i have no real emotional investment to any of the wrestlers in it but uh but i watched it of course and it was solid it was strong it was good for what it was um talos ended up pinning both guys which was impressive at the end i would love to know talos's wrestling history it's something i think i'm, I'm gonna look up because a man of that size and maybe it's his face i, I <laughs> let me not let me reword that. Maybe it's his facials, his facial expressions. Maybe it's, I don't know. Because someone of his size, I would feel like we would have seen him on TV before. You know what I mean? He's a little more like, I don't know. He does. He definitely puts off a more indie vibe than someone like uh, Lance Archer, you know, who looks like a, like a real badass. Talos comes off more like he's probably a nice guy playing a badass. If that makes any sense. But I, I would love to know his history. That is one thing I do enjoy about NWA is that they have big guys. They utilize the big guys well. The big guys win matches. You know, this isn't NWA where the smallest guy wins. You know, I, th- I think I saw a match one time, Orange Cassidy completely bandaged up against uh, uh, Lance Archer. Lance Archer had like three people in his corner. And Orange Cassidy won the match. That shit's not realistic to me. Like, you're not going to see, you know, Gags the Gimp beat uh, Talos. I think, I feel like Gags did beat uh, Jadias one time. I think there were, there's like some shenanigans. I could be wrong on that, but you don't see that. You don't see the big guys, you know, jobbing out to little guys. So, you know, Talos winning here, pinning both guys in one's like, that makes sense. Like, wrestling. Wrestling is missing that. So the match was what it was. Again, I just had no real emotional connection to anyone in it or or what they're doing. But Vampiro's been cutting some like really good promos. He was kind of the star of this episode. <laughs> he wasn't the star, but he was he was featured more than once. Um, you know. So we move on. Uh, and then they have Ricky Morton and the Southern Six talking about their upcoming cage match versus Knox and Murdoch. Um. Kyle Davis is robbing us of May Valentine. You know, they clearly didn't bring her to this uh this set of tapings and pay-per-view, whatever you want to call it. Um I like a good cage match. I like a good cage match. So I'm looking forward to it. I don't like love that overall card they got for next week, much like I didn't really love this one. But I'm really looking forward to the cage match because 
You can put whoever in a cage. I don't really care. I enjoy it. I, you know, majority of the wrestling I watch is, is TNA, and they haven't done a cage match in forever. So I'm I'm looking forward to uh, looking forward to this, and we'll see what they do. I'm not really sure why they're having a cage match. There's there's kind of some storytelling aspects lost a little bit, but that's why they do a good job of when they kick off the episode, they're going to tell you the backstory of that cage match. I promise you they're going to give you a reason why you want to watch that. And that's, to me, that just makes more sense than showing highlights from the previous week all the time. So, but we got Natalia Markova versus Kenji, Kenji Page. Like, to me, this was a one-match episode like i said going into it i was like that's what i want to see because i genuinely had no idea who was going to win markova's had her opportunities and you you would think the potential's there for her to be the top girl but she doesn't get there she keeps losing she doesn't win the big one and then kenzie page as I, as i say every week like just incredible uh when they put the title on her was like, ooh, I don't, I don't know about this one, but she is, she has done everything you you can ask of her to be the women's champion. So it's you, it's like the irresistible force means the immovable object. I'm like, Markova can't, she really shouldn't lose. She can't lose. And then, uh, Penzi, uh, <laughs> Penzi Cage, there's a name, Kenzie Page. On the other hand, I'm like, well, she can't lose either. So those are the kind of like matches. I really like. I shouldn't say that. Sometimes I don't like those matches because I don't like them when they're unnecessary. I'll put it like that. But here you're trying to build, uh, you know, you built up to it. It's a pay-per-view match. Like, you know, it's all good. And um, Markova, I don't remember if it was this week or the previous week. I, I didn't write it in my notes. I feel like it was the previous week. She... She cut a promo, and she, you know, her accent is very thick. I, I, I would imagine that's one of the reasons they haven't gone all in with her, because I want to. I don't want to say she, she can't talk. That's not what it is. I, I can't judge someone. They have a little bit of an accent. They can't talk, but I don't know if it's translating on American television that well, just because the accent is so thick, so it does not come off authentic but she's a big time star for them and i think they're gonna find a way to get her there she probably has always needed a mouthpiece and she hasn't had it they are teasing that vampiro could be that mouthpiece but she is uh she's hesitant on that but if they can get him to talk for her they can take her to the next level that's what's that's what's missing someone who can talk for her like she really shouldn't be talking because she has the look, she has the in ring. You know, she can be a great champion for them. But they just gotta find a way to to limit her speaking. Um, but she she showed off some great offense in this match. Um, just showed you why she should be a star. This was the best women's match they have had in a while. And they have a lot of good women's matches. This one here. This was one of the best ones they had. This was the reason to tune in for the episode. The reason you should watch the episode if you didn't get the opportunity to. Like this is the one. Um, Markova ends up kicking out of the Kenzie Cutter, which is a little little AEW ish for my taste because she kicked out of the Kenzie Cutter. She went for the beautiful disaster and missed, and then got hit. Um, oh no, she got rolled up from there. Oh, no, 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 no. Okay. There was a roll-up that I thought was a three-count. Markova rolled her up. I thought I thought she had her. Um, and then Kenzie hits her with, a, with the, uh, the Kenzie cutter, pulls the tights. So they did do some cheating because, again, like I said, Markova shouldn't be losing. But there was a tights pull. And with that, sometimes you protect the loss, right? Um, Kenzie Page, I'm going to say this. I've said this every single time, and I'm going to continue to say it. She needs a new finisher. If she wants to go to the next level, because she's getting there, her work is great. In-ring, promos, like I can't say enough good about her. 
she has to get away from the fucking cutter. Everyone does the cutter. And no one's ever going to be Diamond Dallas Page. You know, the RKO is not, I guess you can call it a cutter, but it's the most popular version of the cutter ever. You're never going to do it like them. Not her. I'm just talking to everybody. You're never going to do it like them. She has, she needs a new finisher. She just had it kicked out of here. So there's an opportunity now for you to be like, okay, maybe this isn't going to work. The women do struggle to take the cutter sometimes. Not all the time, sometimes. She really needs something new. If she wants to be, you know, take things to the next level, there's just, she has to bust out something in the arsenal we haven't seen before. And that's going to get her there. And that's going to get pretty empowered overall to the next level. So I fully, fully believe they need to do that. Sorry, I had to hit pause there for a second, but uh, I am going to beat that into the ground forever when it comes to Kenzie Page. Then we got a really well-produced, miserably faithful promo. Um, I think this is the way to produce Father James, James Mitchell because in 2024, his character can come off very fake on television. You know, um, just... <laughs> Ew, yeah. You know, like 10 years ago, you know, it, it, it was a fun character, but uh, it, it can come off a little fake on TV if he has a live mic. So I I thought this was a better way of, of uh, presenting the miserably faithful. So the main event on this show, I initially had no interest in this. I was like, why is this the main event? Markova versus Paige should be the main event. It was Magnum Muscle and Carson Drake versus the miserably faithful because Mims put his hands on Father's James Mitchell, and he cannot beat these guys. That's kind of what the the story has been a little bit. He lost his television title to uh, Maxi Impaler, and then I was shocked that he lost the rematch as well. I, th- I was like, okay, they put the title on Maxi Impaler. She has both belts. Very cute. Um, I didn't really agree with the match, the concept of the match to begin with. Uh, but, you know... They're telling a little bit of a story here, so that's okay. That's fine. But I was I was shocked he didn't get the title back. I was pretty confident because I think Mims can be a real massive baby face for this company. Like I remember when he first got there and he was just Mims. You know, he was just some dude. And he has really, if anyone in this company has really grown over the years, it's been this guy. Uh, to where he can be the dude one day, absolutely. And be just a, just a massive NWA champion baby face. I, I really truly feel that. Um, but I I thought he was gonna have his seven you know title defenses as that television champion, and then cash in a face EC3 at one of the big pay per views. I was sure that's where they were going with it, and that would have been uh, one of the biggest matches they could do. But that's not what they did. They're going a completely different direction, which is fine. There's always. You know, when a baby face is struggling to get victories, there's a lot of there's a lot you can do storyline wise with that. And that's kind of what they're doing with Mims. And he need he does need something like that to involve his to evolve his character. Uh this version this version of the miserably f- um faithful is a uh, Judaeus, Maxi Impaler, and Gags the Gimp. So Sovereignalo uh not wrestling in this one. Carson Drake is a heel. He's from NWA Exodus Pro. So I'm like, what? I just don't understand why this match was put together. And again, if I miss something with the build, that's on me. It was just random for me. When I, when I knew the card, that's why I was like, this is a one match show. But this one was really interesting. Um, there was a little bit, they tease a little bit of dissension with uh, Dax. I was going to say Dax the Impaler, Dak Draper, and Mims. <clears throat> there was obvious dissension with Carson Drake because he's a heel, as I said. And they told a little bit of a story, too, in the match, trying to, you know, trying to keep Gags the Gimp in the ring so that he didn't tag out to Jadias or Maxi Impaler, who are much, much bigger than him. I don't even know why they had Gags wrestle to begin with, like have the big ones start the match and keep them in the match. I don't really, but whatever. <clears throat> They did an excellent job of isolating the baby faces. Uh, 
you know, the heels were working like a well-oiled machine. They were saying, hey, these guys are working well together. These guys aren't. Usually in wrestling, if this was AEW, the guys not working together would win the match. WWE would do the same thing. TNA probably would too. But the heels are working very, very well together. Um, and then the, there's the eventual hot tag and the, and the baby face runs in, takes out all three of the heels like that. That style of tag team wrestling really is missing overall in the overall landscape of wrestling. Like you don't, and AEW don't see that. It's all simultaneous cold tags, um, trying to pop the crowd. Their tag team matches lack storytelling 100%. There's no stories to be told in their tag team matches whatsoever. TNA does a pretty good job with it. You know, they're, they're closer to NWA than they are to. AW when it comes to wrestling in general. Uh, you know, I, I just like a little more. I just, oh man, I just enjoy more traditional wrestling. I'm old, so I just like old school. I just can't help it. I can't get into like the that modern style of tag wrestling. I just can't. And this just, you know, this just took me back a little bit. They just, you know, they don't pre present wrestling like this on TV anymore. Hot tags and isolating baby faces and working body parts and all that shit like you know um Saul Ronaldo did a run in he jumped off the top rope to do a cross body block to uh, Dak Draper he caught him um and then from behind uh Max and um Jadias did like a spear clothesline combo a little sloppy but whatever they hit it one two three so I said this last week you know, I like distraction finishes, not distraction roll-ups, but a guy gets distracted and then gets hit with a move that may not even necessarily be a finisher, but it, it's, it wins the match. You know, like, it's just more realistic. It's just more realistic. After this, this is, this is where it got kind of interesting. This is why it was the main event, because I was saying, why is this the main event of the show? Mims, who's, like, clearly frustrated, and again, I said can be a massive baby face. Rolls into the ring. Clotheslines Dak Draper from behind and starts whooping his ass. Both of these guys, by the way, Mims and Dak Draper look like men. Which I appreciate watching a fucking wrestling television show. And Mims is whoop, whooping his shit out of him. Beating his ass. Because he's frustrated. He cannot beat these guys. I don't think he's going to be part of the Misery Faithful, but it looks like we're getting a Mims heel turn. This is going to be quite interesting because he's cut some really good babyface promos lately. And as I said, massive babyface potential. So turning him heel is very interesting. But he takes out Dak Draper. Uh, Carson Drake comes in and kind of watches for a bit, and then Mims spits on him, rolls out of the ring. Then Carson Drake starts whipping his ass. Takes Dak Draper to the outside. Zach Draper gets a babyface comeback, sends uh, Carson Drake into the rail, and then starts to go after Mims. So instead of him getting his hands on Mims, which every other company would do this, they prevented it. Carson Drake came from behind again, and then Mims uh, took advantage of Zach Draper, who wasn't paying attention, and then threw him through the steel cage set, like the, the set that they had there. It was like a, a cage. And then they go off the air. So it's like a bit of a cliffhanger for the next episode. NWA just doesn't get the respect that it does for the way it produces and puts together television. All these big podcasters who get on and they're talking about AEW doesn't do this, AEW doesn't do that. I say the same for TNA, by the way. WWE doesn't do this, WWE doesn't do that. NWA does. Is, is the crazy thing. The wrestling that the things that these bigger podcasters are that they want from pro wrestling when they're watching. NWA has that. They do provide that. I say the same thing about TNA. They, they have these small details. They, they do small details good, but it's because the money in, in, in ad revenue is watching the big shows and they feel like, you know, a lot of these fans, wrestling fans feel like I, I can only watch the big arena live wrestling shows. 
but there's so much good that happens on these smaller shows that people are just not giving the opportunity to for whatever reason. So even though I went into this episode thinking it wasn't going to be all that, I was pleasantly surprised with how it ended up. I thought it ended up being a pretty good overall show. Again, the over the opening match, I just didn't care, but it was part of the U.S. Tag Team Title Tournament, so there was there was meaning to it. I can I can live with that. Kenzie Page and versus and uh, Natalia Markova really killed it as a as a women's title match. One thing I didn't point out, oh my god, I, I cannot believe I completely missed this, is when Markova lost. Uh, Vampiro came in the ring, gave her some black roses. He is trying to recruit her, so. I missed that angle when I missed that part when I was reviewing the match. When I started talking about she needs a mouthpiece, I was going that direction, <laughs> bringing that in, and I completely forgot. So hopefully that is what they do with her. Like Marco is probably better suited as a heel. So it's, it's, you know, to be determined when it comes to her, to what they're doing. But I'm very interested in this Mims heel turn and just want to see where it goes. So it's a little early for me. I was tripping over my words a little start this podcast, but uh, that is it for me. That is Power Moves. I will talk to you guys next time. Peace.